Welcome to our fireside chat. I'm Lynn Wedham from the Donor Motivation Program in the Waterloo Region. My sidekick today is Anne McKay. Anne and I have been looking forward to being with you today. I was thinking back to some of our chats where our hosts were on their decks. That was back in sunny July. We are decidedly indoors today. The season has changed. We've had the fireplace on at our house. Now, let me introduce Anne McKay. Anne has a long list of achievements in the nonprofit world, including roles at the Canadian Cancer Society, the Arthritis Society, United Way, and as a consultant working with agencies right across Canada. Please take a look at Anne's bio and her special interests. I've known Anne for a number of years now. A mutual friend once said, you two need to connect. And I think she recognized that there were some mutual themes as she talked to each of us. What do you think, Anne? I agree 100%. We have very good conversations when we get going. So yeah, I'm always happy to talk to you, Lynn. So Anne, do you have a cocktail recipe to share with us today? I do. It's, um, I, I first I have to show you my jar. I, I'm feeling like I'm traveling around with moonshine. It's, it's just a mulled cider and it's the one from the brand new Barefoot Contessa Modern Comfort Food. And it's got star anise in it and a little um, pepper and cinnamon. How about you? So, so Anne, that, that, I want to talk a little bit, little bit about your drink. That one had sure. bourbon in it. How is, how is, the, uh, how is the, the bourbon in your drink? I, I, I didn't put bourbon in just because I think we know I have the tolerance of a three-year-old. So um, not today, but not today. It, it works. But did you try it with the bourbon in it? I did. It was, it, I did. It was, it was like having a little nice warm fire by your side. It was great. <laughs> so um, the, the drink I have is uh, Howell Road Cider and Howell Road Cider operates on a farm about 10 minutes from the farm where we live. Um, and that farm has been in the Howell family for eight generations. And that takes us back to about 1812. Um, they blend several different kinds of cider. Um, one of them includes hops grown on a neighboring farm. Uh, the one that I'm enjoying is the raspberry lemonade hard cider, uh, which can be purchased only in Ontario and just locally at farmers markets in Burlington, Guelph, Cambridge, uh, and there's two markets in uh, Toronto that carry it as well. So, cheers. Cheers. So Anne, when we planned our year, I think it's safe to say that none of us planned for the 2020 experience. Uh, can you talk about the experiences that you've had that made you think about the power of the pause? Yes, certainly. When, when we started dealing with COVID, Normally, our volunteers do thank you calls during the day. And because they were not able to come back into the building, I started doing them. And I noticed that, um, I, first of all, everyone was picking up the phone. <clears throat> Excuse me. And second, that there were some people dealing with some real loss, um, some of it around jobs, but because of the work I'm in at hospice, loss is always something we're talking about. And there were people who had lost a loved one and perhaps their family were not able to be with them. And so it, it, it was a thank you for money, but it very soon became, how are you doing? What's going on? And sometimes there were tears, you know, somebody burst into tears when she heard where I was from and said, I, I think I just needed to talk to you today. So we'll talk as long as you like. So the the connection changed really quickly, I think. Right. I've, I've the same kind of 
uh, everyone is dealing with a disappointment or worry of some kind in 2020. And I, I find people very open to conversations. Perhaps they just have the time. Uh, maybe it's the isolation. At the very least, I think everyone's dealing with something strange and, and unique. Um, it'd be interesting if our national colleagues would tell us about some of the things that they've noticed or learned while having conversations um, as well um, in 2020. So if you have some thoughts as we go along today, uh, please comment in the chat box. I'm sure your insights will be helpful to everyone. Uh, Anne, you and I talked about working with, with those people that have suffered a loss and are grieving um, because that's the work that you do at the hospice. What have you learned specifically about the power of the pause? Sure. Uh, well, I think for everyone across this beautiful country, you all learn something about the cause for which you are working. And when I first started at hospice, I said, I, I really want to take the volunteer course, partly because I'll be talking about the volunteers and their contribution, and partly because I will be dealing with donors for whom um, a loss is really fresh. I've worked with life and death issues before, but not quite so front and center. And one of the first things they said to us in the program was, you're all compassionate people. You all want to make a difference. And we're like bobbleheads, just nodding. We do want to make a difference. And they said, your job here is to do nothing. It's to just listen. And that's hard because we, we want to give people comfort, but really just being there for them. And you and I have talked about that lovely phrase, tell me more. And I, I was a little late getting here today because I was talking with a donor who was coming in to just give a simple check and, and it ended up being a discussion about her husband died the day they were signing the papers to sell their house. Mm. And, and you just can't walk out on that. So it was just, tell me more. Yeah. You uh, also said something surprising to me about Kleenex. Can, can you, uh, can you remind me? <clears throat> story? Yes, I well, it, for any of you who have watched those fantastic TED Talks about Brene Brown, and if you haven't watched them, you, you got to you got to see them about shame and vulnerability. And she talks about shame for women is not looking like everything's perfect, that you've got everything working. And shame for men is more around if they're perceived as weak. And I had talked to one of our um, grief counselors, who's a retired minister. And I said, I know I am going to be talking to some men who show their vulnerability. How can I um, be a support for them? And he said, do not hand them the Kleenex. Because that tells them that they're supposed to stop crying. And he said, just, just sit there and, and let the moment be. And when they're ready to talk, they'll talk. Now, I, I would hasten to add, one of our other grief counselors said, I do hand people the Kleenex, but she knows how to read a situation so well. And the next week I was talking to a gentleman who'd lost the love of his life, pretty young guy, and um, the tears started and he cried and I cried and it was okay. It, it's just sitting through that awkward moment. Oh, I can see people putting up the, the links to Brene Brown's um, TED Talks. They're great. And, and really it's, um, once you get past the idea that this feels uncomfortable, then it's okay. It's just, it's all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And what I, what I find is that, you know, donors realize there's a health crisis um, and they want to know how it's affecting your organizations because they care about your organizations and they do want to help. Right. Um, so, so may I ask you, Lynn, what about your clients? Well, what I'm finding is that uh, they're, they're certainly open to talking about gifts because some of them actually have more uh, cash in the bank um, because they aren't traveling, they aren't eating out, um, not driving their cars as much. Um, so we shouldn't assume that it's a bad time to ask because of uh, the, the position this year has put us in. 
Um, however, I think that we need to balance that with, with taking the lead from the donor as well. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm finding that people are talking about how they see this moment, how they're interpreting the COVID time. What are you seeing about how people are, are processing that? Well, I think that, you know, some people are, are certainly looking at it through a scientific lens, you know, as, as a health crisis. Um, you know, some are talking about the science. It's become political as well. Um, and that's what some other people are talking about. Uh, you mentioned the other day about how very versatile one needs to be as a fundraiser. Um, and I, I think that's really important. How do you find people framing the situation? Uh, well, I, I hear people talking about their faith and their spiritual beliefs about, um, is this a time for us all to be more compassionate? Uh, especially, I would say older people talking about what does humanity learn? So uh, as you've talked about, I just wait for them to tell me how they frame it. Because some want to talk about this as a terrible thing, and some want to talk about it as we all need to slow down, and this is a good thing for us. So I, I just go along with what they're saying. Right. right. Um, the fact that many listening are hearing some similar perspectives um, or additional ones, and it would be great if our colleagues shared their experiences in the chat box as well, because I'd love to read it uh, afterwards when, when we get a chance to look back on, uh, on those notes. Um, building on your point about listening, Anne, can you tell us about how listening helped you understand someone's story better? Well, um, I, I think I got gently smacked in the head with one of them. When I first, when I first started out, um, I was going to see a lady and she had already made her gift and they were sending me out as the newbie to get the documentation signed. And she was a um, wonderful German lady. And she said during, this, during World War II, she was studying nursing in England and was interned on the Isle of Man. And I, you know, as this innocent young thing said, oh, that's terrible, I'm so sorry. And she said, oh no, ducky, German accent, speaking British English, say, no ducky, it was lovely because half of the island was um, men and the other half women. And she said, because I was a nurse, I got to roam back and forth between everyone. She said, I had a, just a marvelous time. But, oh, okay, uh, that's not what I was expecting. And then another, amazing gentleman who was an officer during World War II and was shot down and was in a prisoner of war camp for officers. And he actually spoke very highly of the German officers saying they did what they were supposed to be doing. We would have done the same if they were in Canada. And he did talk about a moment that was horrific and he said those people were charged with war crimes, but the rest of the officers behaved as we would under the Geneva Convention and respectful of each other. So I, I, they both taught me to just let the donor tell you if it's a good thing or a bad thing. So that's yeah. what I did. And so that comes back to your tell me more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, to, um, to chat with them without judgment about what they're, um, what they're telling you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Anne, knowing your, your role um, at the hospice, how are you moving the conversation back to the agency um, once you have them talking about themselves? Sure. Well, I would say for some people, they really just need to be heard. And it, it might not be about the money. And I'm sure my my colleagues across the country would also talk about sometimes people come in and the only the only word I know how to use is they are blurry with grief they're just overwhelmed and sometimes they feel so grateful they want to make a gift in that moment and I'm always hesitant to talk about it then um, um, so I usually say why don't you just take a little time with your family and I promise I will call you back 
<clears throat> for other folks who were who and and certainly if they challenged me and said I want to do it, I would do that. But I I as we all do, you think how what would I think if somebody did that to my parents when they were just overwhelmed? But um, I try to be ready for whatever people are going to talk about. So one of the pieces is um, being ready with the stories. So Lynn and I, Lynn and I just talk stories when we, when we chat. And so I, sometimes it's very tiny things that I was able to say, you know, once COVID hit, um, a happy story is, is a, a, a woman who said, our granddaughter has come because at the beginning, you could only have one consistent person in the building. And she said, our granddaughter has come today with a ladder because she is bound and determined she's going to see her grandfather's face. And we said, no, no, sweetie, we're on a hill. Just come around the building and you can sit on the porch and we'll move your grandfather's bed out so you can talk through the window. Or something simple like um, in most hospices, there's a, a very formal, um, beautiful ceremony when people leave. And we used to have the ceremonies right in our foyer. And as soon as COVID hit, we moved that outside. And the, the nurses did that. And the other thing they did was at one point, we needed to have um, body bags. And when people come out on a gurney, there's a quilt over them. And usually the funeral home folks would fold up the quilt and give it back to us. And the nurses said, the last view someone has of their family member cannot be in a body bag. So just leave the quilt on and drive away with the quilt and come back at a later time. So, you know, sometimes you're talking about big things. So I think about the stories. I think about um, how programs have changed. So we were able to pivot online. We were able to make sure that at least one family member could be in the hospice. And then it opened up on Father's Day for two people. And then also to know the money. So we know how much it's cost up to say the end of August. And, and depending on what donors are asking, I can give them each of those pieces. And I probably should also just mention one of the things that surprised me because I have never worked in a building before. I've always worked with programs out in the community and I've had a number of people say, what's it gonna cost to get my mom's name on that donor wall? And I, I was very surprised, but then I start to think some people aren't able to have a um, a formal ceremony. So being able to honor their mom on that wall means a lot. And we've got a, a um, cumulative wall. It's, it's a challenge to put together, but it really means a lot to people. And it, and it sort of serves as a welcome when people come in that we say, these are the other folks who stand with you. So that, that piece surprised me. Right. So some of the changes that you've seen would be, um, you know, moving things outside a little bit for people, um, you know, just listen, looking at their needs and, um, you know, listening for, the, for their needs. One of the stories you told um, about your listening to someone's needs uh, was, uh, had to do with stamps. Oh, yes. Well, you just never know what's gonna happen. One gentleman, our mailing went out um, just as COVID hit. And this gentleman sent a, a very nice check and said, by the way, next time, will you send me a stamp? And, you know, one of my colleagues said, oh, don't start with that. Everybody will ask. And I thought, no, if he's taking the time to ask, I'm going to send him some. So I, I wrote him a note and said, Un unfortunately, all our pieces are done together, but I'm sending you a book of 10 stamps. And I suspect that a kind man like you probably has other charities he cares about. So maybe this will help. And he immediately sent me back um, uh, a, another gift and said, I'm in my eighties. Um, it's not easy for me to get out. And in my village, people don't want us coming in because they're worried about us. So I thought, you know what? I bet we have lots of donors like that. Of course, we're late to the table on doing postage paid return envelopes. So I said, well, we'll just do that now. And um, so I thought uh, we have a donor newsletter and I wanted to acknowledge him because it was sort of he who sparked it. And I was calling him and calling him and I couldn't get a hold of him. And it just kind of worried me a little bit. 
And I've never done this before, but on a Saturday, I just drove out to his village and knocked on his door. I, mean, I don't, I really don't hunt down donors like that. And um, knocked and knocked and there was no answer, but it was a tidy little place. So I thought somebody's been around here and I was turning to walk away and I hear the window open and what do you want? And I said, well, I'm Anne, you know, we, we talked from, from hospice and I sent you the stamps and, and um, you had such a good idea. We're going to do it for everybody. And I wanted to tell the story that you started. And he said, oh, there's no need to tell my name. I said, okay. <laughs> hey, we, we're hollering across his driveway because I don't want to get close to him. And he said, yeah, the kids can't come in and I don't get to see people very much. So we chatted. And then as I was saying, you know, it's been lovely to meet you and thank you so much for your kindness. He said, well, when this thing calms down, come and see me. Okay, okay I will do that. So it started with just a book of stamps. It, it was just, you, you all know so well, it's just, those little notes and those little spidey senses that say, I, he took the time to send a note, maybe I should respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great example of, of listening and, uh, and building a relationship. Um, not, may, maybe not such an easy gentleman to build a relationship and, and that was the opportunity to do it just over the stamp, so that was great. Um, you had made a little observation about um, advisors as well, and I, I wonder uh, if you would share that. Yes, I, I was talking to a, a couple of um, pals in the community, and, and um, they both said, I feel useless. There are so many people in hospitals and even grocery stores and, and PSWs who are doing so much. I feel like I, I'm not contributing at all. And I was quick to say to them, you actually are contributing hugely because the people who are taking care of the charitable sector are the people who feel secure with their finances. And you all have done immense things with that. If people were scared, whether their portfolios are large or small, if they feel like they have enough, they're prepared to turn and say, can I help over here? Can I help over here? So I, I really think we owe you all just a huge debt of gratitude because it's it's just, um, it, it's such a full circle thing, right? That we're all just in this together, whatever piece of the puzzle we have. So you guys, you men and women out there helping people, thank you so much. Thanks for that observation, Anne. Um, so if we want people to take away a couple of points, uh, I would start with just listen and tell me more. Just listen because people need it right now. And tell me more because people love to feel that they're understood. What a wonderful time to build relationships with donors. Um, I'd like to emphasize to all of our giving professionals that when you're guiding and encouraging people to make planned gifts, you're helping them make a difference. And we often think of this in terms of the money that our organizations need. Um, but I'd encourage you to think about it from the perspective of the donor. You can help them make an impact and that fulfills their purpose. Think about how important you and your organization are when you make that happen. And how about you? What are your takeaway points? Um, I would say be ready. There have been a, a number of times that I've called people. I called one person at West to, to uh, thank this woman for a donation and her husband said, she died last week. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm so sorry. He said, no, no, we've been following a Buddhist practice. I have an app on my phone that five times a day reminds me you are going to die. So we, we ended up having an amazing conversation. So um, just be ready for however people are gonna perceive this. I think the other one is um, just pay attention. You know, what are people going through? And I wanted to share that wonderful line that Sheryl Sandberg had when um, her husband died suddenly. When she returned to Facebook, so many people were, didn't know what to say to her. So they didn't speak to her at all. 
And she said, the great question is, how are you doing today? Because, and often you'll have people respond and say, that's right, because today is different than yesterday. Yesterday was really hard, today's okay. So I, for so many people dealing with loss, if we don't know how to respond, we don't say anything. And to just let people know, we're here for you, this might be uncomfortable, but you're worth it. And I could listen to your stories for days. However, sadly, our time together is ending. Um, and uh, thanks so much for your insights. Thanks for being here today. My absolute pleasure. And, and I did want to say, um, bienvenue à mes, nos amis francophones. So we know there are people all across the country doing amazing things. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to our next fireside chat on Thursday, November 12th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Rod Abbott from the Donor Motivation Program and Victoria and Veronica Carroll from the Children's Health Foundation of Vancouver Island. Serena will send you along a reminder or you can go to donormotivation.com to sign up. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.